Hello, uh, welcome to our third Thursday webinar series. Today we host How to Know if Crowdfunding is Right for Your Clients with Kathleen Minogue, founder of Crowdfund Better. Kathleen is a crowdfunding educator, speaker, and advocate. After running her own successful campaign in 2012, she founded Crowdfund Better to guide entrepreneurs, small businesses, and social enterprises on how to use crowdfunding strategically to attain their financial, marketing, and business goals. Kathleen has coached highly successful campaigns on major and niche platforms, and is particularly focused on bringing the crowdfunding opportunity to women, minorities, and rural entrepreneurs. Uh, welcome, everyone. I will now hand it over to Kathleen for today's presentation. Thank you so much, Aurora, and thank you to Cameo. Thank you to the SBA for sponsoring this webinar. And thank you all for taking the time to learn about crowdfunding so that you can help your clients uh, determine uh, if crowdfunding is right for them and help them access a new form of capital. Um, as Aurora said, I've been doing this since 2012. It's been eight years and it's my pleasure to talk about it. Um, and so we'll start with uh, outlining what we'll uh, cover in the workshop today. Uh, we're going to talk about what crowdfunding is, how crowdfunding works, how it's, how it's different from traditional funding, what your clients can use crowdfunding for, and the most important piece, how to know if crowdfunding is a good fit for your clients. And then thanks to Cameo, there'll be a little extra help available for those of you that have attended. Um, but if we could start uh, with a poll, just to give me a sense, this is poll number one, Aurora, um, to give me a sense of who's in the room. So uh, the first poll is, what is your experience with crowdfunding? And you can check everyone that applies. Have you run a campaign? Have you helped someone else run their campaign? Have you backed a campaign? Or are you uh, completely new to crowdfunding? So if you could just take a moment and uh, answer that poll. And then uh, when Aurora sees that uh, the majority have answered, she'll post the results. So, this is bliss for me. 62% uh, of you say you're new to crowdfunding. Uh, I uh, am a teacher, that's my background. And so uh, I'm excited that you've uh, taken the time to learn. Um, so we're gonna close that poll and uh, move on. So what is crowdfunding? So this is my definition. It's maybe not the definition others have, but I think it's easy to understand that crowdfunding is when you take a large number of people and those individuals share small amounts, not just of their financial capital, but also their social and creative capital. It's generally done via the internet. And importantly, it's within a limited time window. So it's not ongoing fundraising. Uh, there really is this sense of urgency. And I wanted to start by sharing with you a crowdfunding story. So meet Leah Ferranzani. Leah uh, started a organic pasta business out of the converted laundry room of her home. And after a while, the demand from her friends and family outgrew what she could produce in that small space. And she said, I have to get to a commercial kitchen, but I'm gonna need to pay the rent. And then if I need you know, that commercial kitchen, I'm gonna need to buy new equipment so I can produce more. And so she determined she needed about $25,000 to do that. And she might have gone to a lender, but she chose crowdfunding. And one of the reasons she chose it was not just um, for the funding, but because she could find out really if there was enough demand for her pasta to merit her making that big move and big investment in growing her very small business into a bigger business. So she uh, used Kickstarter. She offered her contributors uh, pasta and cooking experiences with local chefs and and to come in and make pasta with her and she raised 25 over $25,000 uh, and was able to move into that commercial kitchen. Uh, the story gets even better because uh, her business has continued to grow. She moved into a bricks and mortar of her own in the last couple of years 
And then she went back to crowdfunding. Uh, in this past year, she raised another $5,000 from her community in order to stock not just pasta in her store, but tomatoes and cheese and cured meats, all the things they would need to put together uh, dinner for the evening. And um, that brings me to my other definition of, of crowdfunding. And it's really old fashioned barn raising using new digital tools. So it used to be that you know, the people in your geographic area were the only people you could reach. But because of our online tools, uh, you can reach more people, you can reach strangers, you can keep in touch with more people. You know, if it used to be you had your little black address book and now you have Facebook and LinkedIn and your email and Instagram. Uh, and it also provides, all of those are great containers to hold all of these people that you've gathered into your community. So how does crowdfunding work? I mean, there's a lot of information on the internet if you Google crowdfunding. And I look at crowdfunding, this is something that I came up with after all these years of working in this field, that it, your campaign sits on a tripod. It's like a camera and your campaign focuses in on some part of your business. And it stands on three legs. One of those is what works for crowdfunding. And that's really the, the, a big piece of what Crowdfund Better does is help people understand what works for crowdfunding. Um, the other piece is what works for an organization or a business. So if that organization is a solo entrepreneur, as opposed to a business that has dedicated marketing staff, they're gonna have different capacity and they're gonna be able to do different things. And the last leg is the potential supporters for your campaign. Uh, these are the people in your network. And so every decision you make about your campaign really has to work equally with each of these three legs. So does that reward work for those supporters? Is it something your business can produce? And is it something that works in crowdfunding? And if you have an imbalance between these three legs, then your campaign goes out of focus. And, um, and that's really the goal of the preparation is to understand what these three pieces are so that you can have this incredibly focused campaign. And no matter what type of crowdfunding you're doing, there's five main elements. Uh, the first and most important is the story. And these days the story is really told via video, um, although there are some platforms where you can simply have an image and tell your story in text. Uh, another important piece of crowdfunding is funding goal and supporters. And these two numbers are equally important. Yes, uh, what your goal is, how much funding you'd like to raise is an important piece. But the other piece, number of supporters can be just as important because that number, if you're a startup business, say like uh, Leah with her pasta business, it gives you market validation. Yes, I know that there are people who not just for this campaign, but going forward, have the potential to support my business. Time frame, this compressed time frame, which creates urgency, and that's a key pillar of crowdfunding. So having that time so that people take action now and don't wait. And finally, social sharing. So this is the you know, old fashioned barn raising via new digital tools. How do you spread the word? How do you let people know? Uh, and a really important thing to understand is although it's called crowdfunding, it's not really a crowd. Crowdfunding platforms don't create the relationships with your potential contributors. In fact, between 50 and 90% of those contributors will be from what we call your known network people that you have some relationship with already, whether that is friends and family, whether that is someone who signed up for your email list or someone who you've connected with on social media, but everyone who comes to your campaign um, is likely somehow already connected with you or connected say to someone that you know. So that spreading the word, how do you do it? And this list of ways to do it is really in terms of impact, right? So 
a lot of people think that social media is the most important and, and most effective way to get crowdfunding backers. And the reality is that strangers won't back your campaign until you've already reached 30% of your goal. So how are you going to get to that 30%? It really is your team, word of mouth, texting people, emailing people you know, having events, and social media is, um, it can be effective, but it is by far not the most effective way to uh, get the word out about your campaign. I love talking about what makes crowdfunding different. And uh, my colleagues over at Investibule put this infographic together, and I think it really sums it up. Uh, crowdfunding is filling the capital gap because never before have we been able to get to individual people as opposed to on our own, you know, with television or with the newspaper, very difficult to control our message. And so in terms of capital, we've been relying in the past on external sources like venture capital or big banks or community sources um, like CDFIs or credit unions. But those are institutions. And what crowdfunding does is give us the opportunity to reach individuals in our community to raise funding. And this is really important because when you change who does the funding, you change who gets funded. So there may be a product that a, a, a venture capitalist doesn't understand because they're not from that community. But when you go to your community, and that's an important cultural aspect of your community, they're going to get behind you in a way that a stranger who doesn't have that same experience, um, they're not gonna connect in the same way. Also, crowdfunding is based not on collateral or repayment capacity or your FICO score or whether your company is gonna have hockey stick growth. Crowdfunding is based on social capital, goodwill, and trust. And it really is trust with your network that turns into your currency. So a bank may not be able to give you a loan based on the fact that you keep your word, that you show up for others, but your community may be willing to contribute to your campaign because of your character, because of the trust that you've built with them, that when you say you'll do something, you'll do something. Crowdfunding is not the easiest way to raise capital. Um, it may seem like it, it looks, uh, you know, people put up a campaign and all of a sudden they have all this money. Um, there is a lot of work that's involved, but there's also a lot of other assets that a business can get from crowdfunding that can provide a lot of long-term value. So here's a, a, a graphic. On the left, you'll see financial assets. So funding, organic growth, and pre-sales. But really, that right-hand column of the non-financial crowd assets, your campaign can help you brand your business. It can provide proof of concept. It can provide market validation as, you know, as it did for Leah, who you know, she knows that she has a community that's going to support her pasta business. You can test pricing. Will people pay that price for that product? It helps you with customer acquisition. If it's a nonprofit or a community prop, uh, project or a social enterprise, do you have the buy-in of your community? It can give you brand ambassadors. It helps because crowdfunding backers tend to be more loyal than say just you know, online e-commerce backers. You can get customer feedback. You can do research and development. Crowdfunding helps you build your marketing skills. It can help you get PR. I've also seen businesses develop partnerships with other businesses because of their crowdfunding campaign. And then finally, it can be leverage for grants, investors, and loans. Because think about it, if you have a business on one hand who doesn't have capital and doesn't have market validation, and then a business on the other hand who has a little bit of capital and can show on a public site that 100 people have backed their campaign, which business would you feel is, is a little further ahead in terms of demonstrating that they're a viable business? 
it would be the one who has that market validation and a little bit of capital. So here's another story for you. Uh, meet Jorge Garola. Jorge is uh, from East LA, and he came up with the concept for a double-pronged sandal. Uh, Jorge is part of a, what's called the OmniWorks Incubator that helps minority entrepreneurs build their businesses. And, and uh, he, this really was an idea that needed a little bit of capital. And so Jorge tried using GoFundMe to raise capital for his crowdfunding, uh, for his business. And he raised $160. Then Jorge went through the training with OmniWorks, did a 12 week crowdfunding training with Crowdfund Better, and he raised over $5,000 for his business. And even more importantly to Jorge was that he had market validation. This was an idea. He didn't really know if anyone would be interested in his sandals, but he got 64 people to buy a pair of his sandals. Um, and there is a, a piece of crowdfunding that's hard to describe uh, when you look in from the outside. But when Jorge began this process, he had an idea. By the time Jorge finished his crowdfunding campaign, he was talking about himself as a CEO of a business. His self-esteem as a business owner had changed. And he is now the president of the East LA College Entrepreneurs Club. That was the results of this campaign were both financial as well as personal for this entrepreneur. So let's get to, well, what can your clients crowdfund? There are four main types of crowdfunding, and I'll walk through a few examples so that you can understand the different types and see where your clients might fit along the continuum. There's donation crowdfunding. And this is traditional donations taken online. Um, this can be for personal needs and it's for uh, causes and nonprofits also use donation. I don't recommend using donation for entrepreneurial uh, campaigns um, because it often puts an entrepreneur alongside someone with a desperate need. Um, and it's very difficult for them to stand out. And sometimes they look like they're looking for a handout when they're a viable business. So a nonprofit could use it to supplement their fundraising. I've had worked with nonprofits who have used crowdfunding to raise their initial capital. So, you know, until you have some money, some funding, some donations, it's very difficult to get grant funding as a nonprofit. So I've worked with nonprofits who have used crowdfunding as leverage for grants. We also have crowd lending. And this, uh, these are online platforms that match borrowers with individual people, not banks. Um, this could be for uh, startups, individuals, pre-startups, existing businesses, and the most popular platform for this is Kiva. You can get a 0% loan for up to $10,000. Um, and so you can see here, this is a husband and wife small farm uh, who raised $9,000 in order to buy some equipment. Then there's rewards crowdfunding. This is platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And this is really the newest sort of the breakthrough type of crowdfunding, in my opinion, uh, because uh, we've had donation before, we had lending before, but this new hybrid of fan excitement and pre-sales. So um, who's using this? Everyone from individuals to startups, to nonprofits, to social enterprises, to artists and creatives. Uh, rewards crowdfunding is really effective for creative artists who want to make a living doing their art. So this is an example. Uh, Seed and Spark is a platform for video and filmmakers, and they've just added comic book makers as well. Um, and what you do is you say, I want to make this film, and you offer rewards in exchange for people contributing so that you're, you can have the funding to make your film, like copies of the film, or uh, a conversation with the artist, or a walk-on part. So it's a, a, a popular and very effective tool for artists and creatives. It's also great for B2C businesses. 
So if you have a product and you're trying to test the market or a price test, um, say you have a prototype of a product, but you don't have the money for manufacturing. So that's the case with this entrepreneur. Um, his name is Matthew Michael. And that little uh, 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 device there is the whisk wiper. And uh, he had the prototype, but even more than the funding, Matthew wanted the PR. He said, I could put this on Amazon and it would get lost. And so he used crowdfunding in order to raise the funding to take his prototype and have it uh, go through its first manufacturing run. But also, as you can see on the right of this slide, he also got an enormous amount of PR. And that PR was incredibly important because it continue to support his business. The Women's Day piece that you see on the bottom there, that was a year after his crowdfunding campaign that he was named a home and food great value uh, with Women's Day magazine. And then the story gets better because one of his campaign backers from this initial campaign gave him the idea for his next product. They said, well, hey, that's great for a whisk, but do you have it for a KitchenAid stand mixer? And so a year from the day that he launched this campaign, he launched the stand mixer. And if you see on the slide, he had over 2,000 backers. So he had over 2,000 email addresses that he was able to email and let them know about his next product. The, the last type of crowdfunding that I'm going to talk about is investment crowdfunding. Um, this is the only type of crowdfunding where someone becomes an actual investor in your business. So rewards, donation, lending, the individuals who back your campaign are not investors. Once you fulfill the rewards, once you pay back that loan, that individual is not uh, an investor in your business at any time during your campaign or the film. Investment crowdfunding was made legal uh, in 2012 by the Jobs Act. Um, and it's different from the other types of crowdfunding because it is regulated by either the SEC or your state securities uh, agency. Um, but it's a, a very uh, important type of crowdfunding as a business starts to grow. It's um, because you can raise up to a million dollars from everyday people. And until this, uh, the Jobs Act was passed in 2012, it was actually illegal to tell people that you were raising investment in your business for 80 years in this country. So um, investment crowdfunding is brand new. It's only about three years old, um, but it is, uh, has been raising millions of dollars for businesses. Uh, and the one thing I will tell you is that there are costs for investment crowdfunding. So the, the initial cost for rewards or donation or lending are very low. For investment crowdfunding, there are legal and financial compliance uh, requirements that can range anywhere from five to 10,000 or more dollars, depending on uh, what kind of crowdfunding you're using. So uh, just um, that's why I said it's not always the first funding in for, for most businesses. And here's an example of a regulation crowdfunding campaign that is live right now. Uh, so this is a, a woman-led business. Uh, she owns a dessert business, Sarah, and she's expanding her business into hospitality and raising the capital to do that using investment crowdfunding. So if that felt a little like, oh, I couldn't get all the pieces and who was for what, don't worry. In your handouts, you'll get this crowdfunding cheat sheet to use to help you and also to help your clients. Um, it, you'll get it both in English and Spanish. So um, you can share that with your clients and use this as a tool to help you um, navigate the space. So what's the opportunity? What can happen because of crowdfunding? What, what's the potential for your clients? And one of the key pieces of crowdfunding is, is its flexibility. Uh, any stage of business can use crowdfunding. Different types of crowdfunding maybe at every stage. You might start with a Kiva campaign and then move to a rewards campaign and then use investment crowdfunding. Any size of business 
can use crowdfunding from a solo entrepreneur. And there are Fortune 500 companies that are using crowdfunding for market testing and products uh, and R&D. There's few limits on how much can be raised, meaning you can raise a couple hundred dollars or you can raise a million dollars. So only the investment have some very specific limits. But it means that even a business that needs you know, $500 in order to buy supplies, they can pre-sell the product, buy the supplies, and then make the product and deliver it. So it's really powerful because it really can apply in a, in a whole range of financial funding situations. It also has low barriers to entry. So it's not dependent on your FICO score. You don't have to prove repayment capacity. There's no equity injection requirement. So for entrepreneurs who are at the beginning of their journey or their financial situation um, isn't in a place where lenders are, are going to see them as viable candidates, crowdfunding may be a good alternative. It's also, you know, it's crowdfunding. And, and it is a great way for entrepreneurs to get some funding, initial funding, growth funding. Um, they don't have to wait for a loan or investment to start their business. It can also provide a public proving ground before larger amounts of capital are needed. And what I mean by that is a crowdfunding campaign is public. So they can show it to uh, a potential friend, you know, friend or family that are looking to invest in their business. They can show it to a lender and say, I'm demonstrating that there's a market for my product. And you can you know, crowdfund multiple times in order to reach a, a, a larger funding goal. So for example, if you have the need for $50,000 in capital, do you need 50,000 now? Or could your client raise 10,000 now for milestone one, maybe it's 20,000 for the next and maybe they'll, by then they'll be ready for a loan. So um, you can break crowdfunding up, you can crowdfund more than once, it's not like a one and done. It's also great leverage for other types of funding. The SBA did a report talking about how um, crowdfunding can open up other types of funding. So it's not just me saying it. Um, crowdfunding dollars can be used for equity injection or to help a company with working capital while they're preparing to be ready for a loan. Um, there's been research that says that um, the marketing and PR that's required by crowdfunding makes businesses more agile and resilient. Um, and crowdfunding backers by far uh, can be some of your best brand evangelists who will go out and sell your product for you because you're inviting them into the journey during a crowdfunding campaign, as opposed to they click on an icon on an e-commerce site and they never see or talk to anyone, they get involved in your story. And that story is often what makes them a fan of your business for a long time. I mentioned earlier when we looked at that chart, you know, external versus internal individuals versus, uh, you know, uh, the, the institutions that crowdfunding, when you change who the funders are, you change what gets funded. And so crowdfunding supports a more diverse pool of businesses because it looks like the customers out in the world. You know, a VC may not represent what the customers look like in the world. It reflects the population in the world. And therefore, that population of real people may be more willing to fund you than someone who has a very specific experience and, and doesn't understand you know, your product, your service, or the need for that nonprofit. And so women and minorities are more successful at crowdfunding than white men. They launch fewer campaigns. And uh, there was a study done by uh, PwC that women are more successful at crowdfunding across every segment, even technology, hardware, and software. Um, and there's some reasons for that. Um, it's, uh, some of that has to do with how women communicate. Um, they're less transactional, they're more relational. So if you have women and minority entrepreneurs who are having difficulty getting other types of funding. Um, if they're great storytellers, if they're willing to do the work, crowdfunding could be a great option for them. 
And then in terms of the data and, and you know, reporting, crowdfunding campaigns create an average of two and a half new jobs for every successful campaign. So you know, if your entrepreneurs launch a campaign and grow their business, they're creating potentially new jobs. So what are the barriers then? Why isn't everybody crowdfunding? Well, um, uh, the, the bullet that's not here is not everyone wants to do the work. Uh, crowdfunding, I mean, people say there's no easy money. Well, crowdfunding isn't easy either. Um, but a recent survey found that 58% of small businesses would consider crowdfunding, but they don't understand how it works. Uh, and there's a lot of information on the internet. And uh, unfortunately, much of that information pertains to very specific types of campaigns. Some of it is really dated. And when I've talked to entrepreneurs, what they really want is uh, support that's personalized to their type of campaign and to their business. Thinking back about that tripod that reflects what works for crowdfunding, what works for their business, and what works for their potential supporters. And there isn't a lot of professional development to help advisors identify and support businesses who are good candidates. Um, but thanks to, thank you Cameo, um, we can change that with this group at least, um, because by attending this webinar, you are going to get access uh, to submitting uh, your, some of your clients to have a crowdfunding roadmap. This is a tool that Crowdfund Better uh, uh, provides. Um, it's a three-step process uh, that helps us to help clients know if they're a good candidate for crowdfunding, to understand what they would need to do to be successful, to help them figure out what a realistic funding goal is. Um, and so we send them an online questionnaire, we provide a written report, and then after they receive the report and have a chance to read it, uh, you can, um, they get on the phone with us for 30 minutes and talk it through. And as their advisor, you would participate in that entire process. So they fill out the questionnaire, you get the report, they get the report. We get on the call with them, you join. So you can be a part of that process and understand if they're a good candidate and also because the report and the call will identify areas they need to work on to be more successful if, your, uh, if your, uh, your organization can provide those services, you'll know exactly that you know, just-in-time help that they'll need in order to get to the goal. So I did want to spend some time on this webinar helping you understand what kinds of businesses would uh, be a good candidate, say, to put through for the crowdfunding assessment and roadmap. And um, it really comes down to, are they ready? Are they willing? And will it be of value? And I'm going to walk through uh, five questions in the next couple of slides that will help you to uh, think about that and don't worry about writing these questions down because the other handout that you're going to get uh, will be uh, these questions to take with you and so then when you're sitting with clients uh, that you can walk through these questions with them. So the first, readiness. Is your client comfortable with the idea of asking friends and family as well as strangers for funding in person and online via things like their website, email, and social media? And this is so critical because I have had individuals who, you know, check every other box, but they say, I don't want to ask anyone for money. And if that's the answer, then really crowdfunding is not for them or it's not for them yet. Uh, do you think your current network or their current network, both personal and business, would be enough to help them raise at least 60% and in some cases up to 90% of the funds they need. And I say personal and business because if you have a really early stage business, they may not have business marketing assets yet. But are they 
really active in their community? Do they have a lot of uh, friends that they have their email addresses? Do they have a large social network? So there are uh, you know, two buckets, both personal and business, um, that they, you have to assess if they have a $50,000 goal and they don't have a business email list and they don't really have a lot of personal assets, um, they may not be in the position to crowdfund at least for $50,000. That's where we go and we look in this report at milestones. Well, is that, you know, truly what you need? Let's look at the size of your network and determine if you set a much smaller goal, would you be able to get that first stepping stone in terms of capital? Willingness. And this is really critical. Is your client able to wait a minimum of 60 to 90 days to launch their crowdfunding campaign? in order to develop and execute on a day-to-day -day crowdfunding strategy. I recommend that all my clients prepare for at least 60 and sometimes 90 and sometimes even more for their crowdfunding campaign because it's what you do before your campaign that will help you to succeed. If you are putting your strategy together on the fly once your campaign launches, your campaign is not destined to succeed. I talked about earlier, you need 30% of your campaign funded before strangers will contribute. And really, you need to know you have that 30% before you even hit launch. So that's, you're spending the 60 to 90 days ahead of your campaign, not just putting together your campaign page, but really mapping your network, understanding who you know and how you know them and how do you talk to them and creating the message that will make them pay attention because it's a busy, noisy world out there. Does your client and their staff have the time or the financial resources to invest in strengthening their business marketing capacity or connecting with their existing network offline and online? So if your client you, during the readiness determined that they don't really have a network yet. Do they have the time to invest in ways to grow their network? Or do they have a little bit of capital to invest in getting some help? Or can they come to your center and work with you uh, to help strengthen their marketing assets? But this is really the, are they willing to do the work? And finally, value. Does crowdfunding have value for their business beyond money? And it's a lot of work. It might be simpler in their minds to, to you know, just ask someone for a loan, but there are other values that we talked about earlier. So are they interested in the non-financial benefits of crowdfunding, such as branding, proof of concept, market validation, price testing, customer acquisition, marketing and PR? And um, if you could, Aurora, um, I think it's poll two. Um, if you could launch poll two, I'd love to know which of these non-financial values you think um, would be most valuable to your clients. So beyond the funding, if you could take a minute and check the boxes of any of these that you, um, actually the top three, what are your top three in terms of beyond the Monday, money, what would be valuable for your clients? And once Aurora sees most of you have answered, she'll post the results. So let's see, it looks like um, community buy-in and customer acquisition, market validation, price testing, proof of concept. Wow, I, you know, what it feels like to me is there's a lot of value in a lot of these different areas for your clients. Thanks for, uh, for, finish, for filling out that poll. So I wanted to end this 
uh, webinar with telling you a story of crowdfunding to bankability and back to crowdfunding. So meet Andrew McDowell. He is the founder of With Love Marketing Cafe. And he didn't work in food, he worked in marketing, but he lived in South Los Angeles. He lives in South Los Angeles. And he noticed uh, that the community didn't have a lot of healthy food. And he decided that he wanted to do something about it. But because he has no background as a grocer and he doesn't, not independently wealthy and can't fund it on his own, he said, okay, well, I'm gonna go out and talk to people. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna go survey people at bus stops and churches and online. I'm gonna find out what they want. I'm gonna to try to get some support. Um, he you know, did wine and cheese nights and tried to get people to you know, contribute to his efforts to build uh, his local healthy food cafe. He didn't have much luck at getting the dollars, but he had a lot of luck in building community. And so that's when I met Andrew and he said, I would like to try crowdfunding and see if this can really get my community to support this idea financially. And so from that community of South LA that a lot of people had written off as too low income to be able to support a project like this, he raised over a hundred thousand dollars so that he was able to move the project forward. But he needed a lot more than $100,000 to open the doors of his cafe. So he kept talking to people and he raised about $250,000 in impact investments from people in the community who also cared. During that time, he had over a thousand volunteers, many of whom discovered him and this idea for this cafe and market through his crowdfunding campaign, they came and helped with this site demolition and planting trees and cleaning up the neighborhood. But he still needed a million dollars total to open this business. So he went and talked to lenders. And he talked to 15 lenders, 14 said no, one said maybe. He kept working with the one that said maybe. And in the end, it was the crowdfunding campaign and the backers, the number of backers, the number of people in the community that wanted this business that helped to bring the lender on board and he was able to raise the full million dollars that he needed to open the business. And this is a picture of the grand opening of the business in March of 2016. Uh, they just celebrated their three-year anniversary. And with their three-year anniversary, they have moved from rewards-based crowdfunding to launching a California direct public offering, which is an investment crowdfunding campaign in order to grow their social enterprise. So they are currently raising money from residents of California and Los Angeles in particular to pay off their bank loans, to give them the funds to open a second location and to nurture entrepreneurship in their community through a cafe cart program. So from his beginnings in crowdfunding, he went through you know, crowdfunding, uh, traditional investment, bank lending, and then back to crowdfunding for the next step in, in terms of growing the business and really reaching back to his community. Because the other piece of this direct public offering is his ability to generate wealth in the community because again, they're, the community and not just wealthy investors will be able to invest in the business and also receive a financial return as the business grows. So I thank you all for uh, your participation in this webinar. Um, I'd love to answer some questions. I think we have some time. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna uh, ask you if you have some questions, if you want to put them in the chat and I'd be happy to answer them.
Oh, and Heidi says, yes, we can also unmute you and so that you can ask your question live. Uh, if you have questions about the assessment and what that is, um, I'd be happy to answer those as well. Um, the other thing, if you have a, a potential client that you're thinking about and you want to uh, you know, tell their story and ask you know, while we're live here, um, if you think they'd be a good candidate for crowdfunding, I'd be happy to do that. There is oh. a question from Sarah. Yes, yeah, so Sarah, thank you for asking your question. So what are some examples of rewards for a service company? Uh, that's a great question, Sarah, because um, service companies can be a little trickier because you don't have a, a thing to offer, um, you know, a product, a, a widget. Um, really, um, this, for services, you have to be incredibly creative. So what are some of the things that you could offer that would be sort of limited? Uh, could you have others volunteer or donate their services? So, and you have someone who has a related business. Um, so if you're say in fitness, maybe a nutritionist would donate their services and then you would get the, the reward, the financial uh, uh, contribution, and they would provide that as, um, as, a, as a sort of an in-kind donation to you. Um, the other thing is there is a, a platform um, that allows for uh, sponsored rewards where you can uh, get businesses from the community to contribute gift cards to your campaign and then um, you know, you receive the proceeds and they get the gift card. So um, there's some creative ways. That's the kind of thing that we would discuss during that uh, crowdfunding assessment and roadmap, you know, how to solve some of those problems. So, uh, so it looks like that answered your question, Sarah. Uh, okay. Is there a list for the various crowdfunding platforms? So that cheat sheet that you're gonna get as one of your handouts uh, has the names of the majority of platforms. Um, there's more than I've listed, but those that I've listed, I either know the founder personally, um, or they've been in the crowdfunding space for long enough and I've worked and launched campaigns on their platforms, so I know that they are legitimate and, um, and you don't have to worry about uh, you know, that question. So, um, I want to leave room for some more questions, but um, maybe we could go ahead and talk about the, uh, the assessment and how uh, they can access that. Yes, definitely. So if you do have uh, any other questions in the next few minutes, feel free to add them into chat. Uh, I will go ahead and explain the assessment. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, for putting that slide on the screen. So Cameo, like uh, Kathleen mentioned, has rapid assessments that we are providing for your clients. It is a $75 value for each assessment and they are available to Cameo members. So if you are a Cameo member, your clients may have the opportunity to be able to have this assessment with Kathleen. So the assessment involves a questionnaire, a written report with what you see on the slide in front of you, and a 30 minute call to review the results of the report. So if you have one or maybe two clients that you think would really benefit from the assessment, feel free to contact me directly. Um, I'm going to add my email address into chat so you can email me. Uh, we will be taking um, names of clients on an ongoing basis, but really we, the cutoff date is February 1st. So you have about two months to think about who would be one or two clients from the organization that you think would benefit. And if you have more than those two clients, we can definitely add them to our wait list. Um, as an added bonus, Kathleen is available for a limited amount of clients who truly are ready for a campaign. Um, and that will be more of an ongoing um, case by case basis. Okay, uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, many of you have probably received our invitation. Cameo is turning 25 this year and we are celebrating in exactly two weeks in San Francisco. So I also welcome you if you are in the Bay Area or want to take a quick trip up to San Francisco. I also added to um, our chat the Eventbrite registration form so you can join us in two weeks. And then, our, like I said, our webinars are every month. Next month is our last webinar of the year. And it's actually on a different date, not on the third Thursday, but on December 11th. So I'm adding that into our chat as well. And if you could go to the final slide, Kathleen, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so on December 11th, we will have our last webinar and it is California and small business policy, what you need to know. So this is really to get your clients prepared for any new regulations that are st starting in January of 2020 and what they need to be in compliance. And we will also share Cameo's first ever scorecard and you will learn about how you can keep legislators accountable. So I will check to see if there are any other questions. Otherwise, uh, you have my contact information. Everyone will get this um, recording and the two handouts that Kathleen mentioned during her presentation. Um, it doesn't seem like there are any other questions. Kathleen, if there's anything to add um, before we sign off. Sure, sure. Um, Sarah just had a follow-up question. Oh, great. Um, so um, she was kind of following up and she asked, so a company whose target audience is B2B, would crowdfunding st still be a good tool to gain more PR and potential brand evangelists? Um, and the answer is, it really depends on that tripod, right? So what works for crowdfunding, what works for your business, what works for your potential backers. So what you would need to understand is, is what you're going to offer going to be attractive to your potential backers. Uh, and again, that's exactly the kind of things we discuss during this assessment. Really, um, the benefit of the assessment is you answer questions about your business. And instead of us you know, going into a call a cold where you spend a half an hour telling us about your business, we already know, we've already researched your marketing assets and looked at your website. And so we start the call with you ready to spend a full half hour uh, with you and your client uh, to dig in. And so you may walk away from that call, you or your client, and have everything you need. Wonderful. Well, Kathleen, thank you again. As someone who, as you know, um, I had my own successful crowdfunding campaign. I still learned so much from your presentation and I found myself nodding uh, as to everything that you were saying regarding how much work is involved and how much preparation is needed to launch and have a successful campaign. And something that I learned is that it is okay to return to your community after you've launched a campaign, whether that campaign was successful or not successful, it is okay to return to your community and ask for more support. True. So um, True. thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Everyone that is on, like I said, will get uh, more information from us shortly. I do appreciate you all and um, have a wonderful holiday. Thank, thank you, you all so much. Thank you, Cameo.